Germany and the origins of World War I. 100 years ago, on December 8, 1912, the German Emperor, Wilhelm II, convened his most important generals and admirals in his castle in Berlin, even though it was a Sunday. Embarrassed about the report of the German ambassador to the court of St. James, about his conversation with the British Secretary of War, Lord Haldane, that it would be impossible for Britain to remain neutral if the Balkan crisis would cause a war between Germany and Austria on the one hand, France and Russia on the other, he thought it necessary to discuss what Germany should do now or in the near future. During this conversation, the chief of the German general staff, General von Molke, pleaded for war, the sooner the better. In Moltke's eyes, due to the armament programs of Germany's neighbors, the nation's chances of winning a great European war were getting worse every year. The earlier a war broke out, the better for the German army was confident to be successful and to beat its enemies. After a long discussion, the decision to start a war was, however, postponed for the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Grand Admiral von Tirpitz had to admit that the Navy would only be ready for a war in July 1914. Then Tirpitz promised not only the strategically important Kiel Canal would be deep enough for the new dreadnought type battleships, but several new battleships and battle cruisers would have joined the fleet and increased its strength. For some historians, this war council as already the Chancellor ridiculed, this event seemed the beginning of a decision-making process which was supposed to carefully prepare a war between Germany and its enemies in 1914. Apart from the fact that this is a rather deterministic view of historical events and developments, there are indeed good reasons to argue that the situation in 1912 as well as in 1914 was more complicated than such an argument suggests. Firstly, the fact is striking that neither the Chancellor nor the Foreign Secretary had been invited to this war council. Although the military played an important role in German politics, without their approval, such a far-reaching decision simply could not have been taken. Second, although the army was again enlarged in 1913, the second time within two years, the Chancellor did everything to avoid further conflict. Instead, he even tried to pave the way for better relations with Great Britain despite the naval problem. If we take this for granted, so why did the situation escalate in the way that many of those who were responsible in Germany in 1914 came to the conclusion that the risk of a great war in Europe was calculable? if not e indeed acceptable. In order to answer this question, it seems necessary first to describe Germany's position within the International Concert of Powers, second to analyze the aims of Germany's policy makers, and moreover the impact of the military and not to forget of the public on foreign policy, third the reaction of Germany's decision makers on the assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand in June 1914, as well as the role of the other powers in these crucial weeks, which eventually sealed the fate of the international system, which, since the Congress of Vienna in, 19, in 1815, had successfully prevented a great war in Europe. In many ways, Germany was a latecomer. After the collapse of the Holy German Empire in 1806, due to French pressure and the establishment of only a loose confederation of 42 states in 1815, a modern nation-state was only founded in 1871 as a result of the so-called Wars of Unification. After the defeat of two great powers, Austria in 1866 and more importantly France in 1870, Germany became the most powerful state on the European continent. Benjamin Disraeli, the leader of the British Conservative Party at that time, described the apprehensions this change in the equilibrium of powers entailed 
as a revolution whose impact was much greater than that caused by the French Revolution in the 1790s. Being aware of the inherent dangers of this position, Germany's Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, however, steered a careful course between the European great powers. Thus Bismarck hoped to pre preserve peace, which he regarded as essential for the existence of the German Empire and for preventing the formation of a hostile coalition. Moreover, Bismarck fully accepted that Germany's security and welfare in the future depended upon renouncing any attempts at disturbing the fragile European balance of powers by directly or indirectly enlarging its sphere of influence in Europe. In his nightmares, he was haunted by the idea that the lack of self-restraint as well as of the confidence of the other powers of the Council of Europe might end up in self-destruction. Even though Bismarck eventually gave his consent to the acquisition of colonies in Africa and in the Pacific, when all European powers began to conquer new territories outside Europe in order to strengthen their positions in a globalizing world, he never shared the colonial enthusiasm of many of his contemporaries. Instead, <coughs> he told an astonished explorer who wanted to convince him of the advantages of a greater German colonial empire by showing him parts of Africa which he wanted to acquire for Germany on a map, he said, my map of Africa lies in Europe. On one side there is Russia, on the other side we have France. Bismarck's successors, however, did not share the latter's deep-rooted conviction that a moderate course in foreign affairs was a prerequisite for the status of the empire among the European powers. Rather, the accession of the young emperor Willem II to the throne in 1888 marked the end of a long era of self-restraint and land power thinking. It would be too simple, though, to explain this change as, as the result of the influence of the new and somewhat erratic German emperor. In many ways, Wilhelm II was only the embodiment of a change that had slowly <coughs> taken place in Germany. If we look at German politics, it is striking to see that an increasing number of politicians as well as parts of the populace regarded Bismarck's dogma of self-restraint as outdated and politically misleading. Why, this critics ask, should Germany continue to protect Austria-Hungary against Russia and Russia against Austria-Hungary? Why should Germany alone among the great powers be denied the right to an independent policy founded upon its own interests? Why high-ranking members of the Emperor's military entourage, foreign office officials and parts of the public even asked, shouldn't the Reich even risk a preventive war against Russia or France, or perhaps even both of them, to become the hegemonic power of the continent and thus solving the dilemma of its geographic position in the center of Europe? In the eyes of the anti-Bismarck front, the foreign policy of the Iron Chancellor seemed static, unable to adapt to the fundamental changes that were taking place at the same time. As a result, Germany was about to lose the advantages of its political, economic and military strength. Moreover, following Bismarck's convictions of Germany's role, both in Europe as well as in the world, might eventually even mean the beginning of decline instead of a further increase of power and political influence, progress and wealth, and not to forget of political stability at home. If we look at the fact the demise from the policy of the aging Iron Chancellor seemed compelling. First, the world had indeed begun to change. The whole international system was in a state of flux. In the 1870s and 80s, as a result of Bismarck's diplomacy, which had somehow integrated all European powers into a system of overlapping defensive alliances to Germany's advantage, France had been isolated. Developments in the Balkans, however, had helped to slowly drive a wedge between the Empire and its most important allies, Russia and Austria-Hungary. 
Against this background, the decision of Bismarck's successor, former General Caprivi, not to renew the so-called reinsurance treaty between Germany and Russia in 1890 seemed logical, for it eventually somehow seemed to make things easier. In Caprivi's eyes, Germany's treaties with Austria-Hungary and Russia were full of contradictions and probably of little use if war broke out. Second, whereas Bismarck had at least tried to find new allies, his successor preferred not to tie his hands. He felt confident that, on the one hand, Germany, which expanded its army enormously in 1893, was strong enough to deter any enemy and to withstand any coalition. On the other hand, in the eyes of the most important decision makers, the disadvantages of entering a new alliance, either with Britain or with Russia, outweighed the advantages of a policy of independence and military self-reliance. An alliance with Britain would have meant to renounce further colonial expansion. An alliance with Russia would have meant drawing Germany into the political mess in the Balkans and alienating its most reliable ally, the dual monarchy. Last but not least, continuing rivalries between France and Russia, as well as Britain and Russia, seemed to allow Germany to play the role of a tertium gaudens, a laughing third, who in the case of a great struggle between the other great powers, could opt for that power or coalition of powers which was willing to make the best offer in return for German support. Eventually, such a development would have helped Germany to revolutionize the international system and to replace Great Britain as the leading world and sea power. In the end, within two years, this policy helped to drive Russia into the arms of France despite many obstacles and despite the huge gap between an autocratic monarchy and a republic whose roots dated back to the French Revolution. The impact of this renversement des alliances proved far-reaching although nobody could foresee the international constellation of 1914 at that time. Nevertheless, from then on, German politicians and generals would have to plan for a two-front war instead of feeling relatively secure due to a system of defensive alliances. This change in German foreign policy, with its ensuing deep impact upon the international system, coincided with far-reaching changes in other era areas. Germany's population ranked second behind Russia. It had risen from 41 million in 1871 to 57 million in 1900, thus by far exceeding that of Britain, which had 41 million, and France with only 39 million at the same time. Similarly, the latecomer had also overtaken its neighbors in important fields of industrial production. Whereas Germany's production of cast iron and steel had amounted to only one-third of, of the British in 1870, Germany had outclassed Britain in this respect in 1900. The German chemical, electrical and optical industries were the best in the world, and though Germany was only a constitutional, non-parliamentary monarchy, the social insurance system introduced by Bismarck in the late 1880s was unique. German scientists and researchers, German artists and novelists were famous for their works within and outside the country. Against this background, it was only natural that Germany, after a period of zigzagging in the mid-1890s, eventually deliberately embarked upon a course commonly called Weltpolitik. As Max Weber, a famous sociologist, put it in his inaugural speech at the University of Freiburg in 1859 and uh, 95, the foundation of the Reich would have been a foolish prank unless it had not been the beginning of an era of further expansion. Unquote. In a long memorandum to his political masters in Vienna, the Austrian ambassador in Berlin described this change in German foreign policy on the eve of the introduction of a new naval law into the Reichstag in early 1900. Quote, the leading German statesmen, and above all Kaiser Wilhelm, have looked into the distant future 
and are striving to make Germany's already swiftly growing position as a world power into a dominating one, reckoning hereby upon becoming the genial successor to England in this respect. People in Berlin are, however, well aware that Germany would not be in the position today or for a long time to assume the succession, and for this reason a speedy collapse of English power is not desired, since it is fully recognized that Germany's far-reaching plans are at present only castles in the air. Notwithstanding this, Germany is already preparing with speed and vigor for her self-appointed future mission. In this connection, I may permit myself to refer to the constant concern for the growth of the German labor forces. England is now regarded as the most dangerous enemy, which, at least as long as Germany is not sufficiently armed at sea, must be treated with consideration in all ways. But because of the universally dominant Anglophobia, it is not easy to convince public opinion of this. A powerful navy was supposed to be both the symbol of this change as well as the most important instrument to implement this policy either in a cold war or in a hot war with Great Britain. Of course, the young Kaiser was a naval enthusiast who could hardly await imitating the example of his British relatives. However, in a globalizing world, only a powerful navy seemed able to defend Germany's global interests and to secure the so-called place in the sun. There are several political setbacks in, it. in international politics in the mid-1890s had made clear Germany risked being taken seriously in conflicts over the distribution of the last three spaces in the world as long as it was unable to project power overseas. However, sea power, or as Tirpitz, the main architect of Germany's build, naval build-up, more often put it, naval presence, Seegeltung, was allegedly a prerequisite for the protection of the German colonies as well as of economic wealth, industrial progress and commerce. Without a strong navy, Tirpitz kept on arguing, and many people believed him, Germany would be unable to preserve its steadily rising sea interests and subsequently inevitably decline to the status of a pre-industrial poor farming country. Finally, sea power also had important domestic political implications. The government hoped that the acquisition of sea power and the envisaged great success of world policy through the plan carefully designed by Tirpitz would safeguard the overall expansion of German industry, foreign trade, colonies and the Navy, and, what is more important, thus offer a permanent solution to the social problem which threatened the existing political and social order. In many respects, the concept Turbitz developed in the mid-1890s was congruent with the ideas of the prophet of a new navalism, the US naval officer Alfred T. Mahan. From his study of Britain's rise to world power since the Dutch wars in the 1600s, Mahan had deduced the overall importance of sea power for the rise and fall of states. Like Mahan, Turbitz was convinced that only a battle fleet could defeat the enemy's fleet in order to gain command of the sea and thus attain naval supremacy. Accordingly, this fleet was supposed to consist of 41 battleships 20 large cruisers, 40 small cruisers, 144 torpedo boats, and 72 submarines in 20 years' time. Of course, this remarkable force could, would still be inferior to the Royal Navy, but Tirpitz was convinced that Britain could not outbuild Germany due to financial restraint and the lack of personnel, and that therefore the margin of inferiority between the Imperial Navy and its future enemy would not exceed one-third. With the fleet unfolding its greatest military potential between Helgoland and the Thames, superior tactics and better trained crews, Tirpitz regarded victory over the Royal Navy as possible. This optimistic view, however, was based on two important assumptions. First, he assumed that the Royal Navy 
would only be able to bring about half of its strength into action due to its overseas commitments. Second, he hoped that the design of capital ships would not change dramatically in order to keep the costs of his ambitious shipbuilding program within certain limits. Any change in either respect was to have dramatic repercussions on this whole program. Strategically, the Royal Navy might thus undermine his chances of being more than simply a risk fleet. Politically, any cost increase would raise again the old question of whether Germany did in fact need a fleet and, moreover, might even disturb the fragile balance of domestic politics. At the turn of the century, Turbitz was, of course, optimistic that he could avoid falling into any of the traps that might lie on the way to his ultimate aim. Step by step, building three capital ships every year, he skillfully began to realize these aims. This building rate ensured that the fleet would very soon consist of modern vessels. Moreover, by adding six armored cruisers in 1906 and accelerating the building tempo from three to four ships a year in 1908, Turbitz further accelerated the building, the build-up of this formidable force. Most important of all was, though, Turbitz's decision to follow suit the launching of a complete new type of battleships, the Dreadnought. This meant that Germany and Britain, unless the latter accelerated its building rate, uh, would soon possess almost equal numbers of modern vessels. From this is it, it is evident that building a big navy also had severe repercussions on Germany's foreign policy. Most importantly, it forced the German government to avoid arousing suspicion for many years, for this might help form a coalition which could prove detrimental to its ambitions. Difficult as such a course was in itself, anyway, due to unforeseeable changes in international politics, it did not consider adequately that the enormous costs of the build-up of the Navy required public agitation as well as visible success in order to gain support of the Reichstag. Subsequently, German foreign policy oscillated between the policy of a free hand, attempts at forming new alliances and political demonstrations like the Kaiser's landing in Tangiers in 1905 or the Panther League in 1911 intended, intended to make clear that Germany was still an important player in the great game for the distribution of the world. Eventually, all assumptions underlying the shift from a traditional continental policy based on a strong army to an ambitious world and naval policy proved completely wrong. Much earlier than often assumed, both the public as well as the naval authorities had closely watched the development of the German Navy. As early as September 1901, the Director of Naval Intelligence in Britain had argued with respect to the future strength of the German Navy, quote, as the German Navy will be at that date a much greater danger to this country than the fleet of Russia, it would be necessary to, make, to maintain a force in the North Sea sufficient to, make, to mask the German fleet, unquote. For the time being, however, the Admiralty watched the build-up of the German fleet with relative calmness despite the rising Germanophobia in the public as well as among leading politicians. The more Anglo-German relations deteriorated due to misunderstandings or direct clashes over different, different interests <coughs> in world affairs, the more important became the naval question. The result was a naval arms race which reached its climax in 1912. Whereas the Admiralty in London had hoped that the, dread, that the dreadnought leap would not only secure the necessary margin of security, but also force the German Navy to realize that it was useless to compete with the Royal Navy, Turbitz regarded this step as a golden opportunity to diminish the gap between the two fleets. In the end, this assumption proved wrong, for the Royal Navy left no doubt that it was willing to defend its supremacy, however costly this might be. More importantly, 
The Anglo-German arms race coincided with far-reaching changes of the international situation. For various reasons, Britain had begun to settle its differences with many of its rivals or potential enemies from the Far East to the European continent. In 1904, Britain and France formed the Entente Cordiale, and the defeat of Russia against Japan facilitated a rapprochement which settled differences between both countries in East Asia and the Middle East only three years later. Though driven by the desire to diminish the increasingly heavier burden of imperial defense, these agreements also had the effect to contain Germany. However, this did not mean that the future war was already foreordained. Despite alarmist reactions in Germany, including the theatrical collapse of the German Chancellor during a debate in the Reichstag, the tribal alliance that went to war in 1914 still lay beyond the mental horizons of most statesmen. The great turning point of 1904 to 19, uh, and 1907 helps to explain the emergence of the structures which within a continental war in Europe became possible, but it cannot explain the specific reasons why that conflict arose. The Franco-German agreement on Morocco in 1909 and the Russo-German agreement of 1910 uh, are examples that successful negotiations between members of the two power blocs were still possible. This is also true for Anglo-German relations. <coughs> Despite, despite British worries about Germany's naval build-up, both countries had begun to talk about some kind of agreement diminishing the danger of a serious conflict in 1909, as well as the financial strain this entailed for both sides. It was in fact the fear of a further escalation of the naval arms race which prompted both sides to continue these negotiations on the eve of the introduction of a new novella in 1912, when the British Secretary for War, Lord Holden, went over to Berlin. The German people has carelessly toyed with the idea of a great war in fall. The Chancellor confided to a close friend on Christmas Eve 1911, hoping to find support in stemming this start. These top-level negotiations, however, proved futile as far as the naval question was concerned. While Turpitz eventually refused to drop the novella, the talks between the Chancellor and the Liberal government made no headway. Both German and British demands on either field proved incom incompatible as in the years before. Against the background of an anti-English feeling in Germany, the Chancellor simply had no choice but to ask for an agreement which guaranteed Britain's neutrality in case of a war between Germany and France. This was, however, unacceptable and difficult to understand from the Liberal government's point of view. What we can offer them, offer them is quite sufficient to show friendliness, and that should be quite enough for them if they have no designs upon other people, the British ambassador, wrote to the permanent Undersecretary of State in the Foreign Office in late March 1912. In theory, the British ambassador was right. In practice, however, he completely misjudged the domestic aspects of the Chancellor's foreign policy, not to speak of the latter's difficult position within the uh, politocratic chaos uh, of the German political system. Eventually, both sides dropped the matter. The doves in Germany, it seems, had again lost against the hawks. Subsequently, the Royal Navy once again increased her building rate in 1912, in spite of the financial strain this entailed. Moreover, she also withdrew her modern vessels from the Mediterranean in order to strengthen her position in the main theater of war, thus impeding Britain's freedom of action in case of continental war somehow. Nevertheless, the two years following the Hordain mission were in fact years of some kind of détente. Firstly, neither Gray, the British Foreign Secretary, nor Bethmann Hollweg, the German Chancellor, thought it wise to touch the naval question again. Both of them were convinced that negotiations on this issue would do more harm than good. Moreover, they had realized that more confidence was necessary to deal with such difficult matters 
as the reduction of naval expenditure or the conclusion of some kind of political agreement, which in the end would satisfy no one. Instead, to restore confidence, it seemed promising to start talks on peripheral questions such as the Baghdad Railway or the future of the Portuguese colonies. Apart from that, success in these fields would also enable the Chancellor to prove that he was steering the right course in world politics. Success in foreign affairs seemed indeed necessary, for from the point of view of the taxpayer as well as the adherents of world policy, the list of political blunders had become longer every day. Germany's attempts at exploiting French difficulties in Morocco to bolster the prestige of the imperial government as well as to demonstrate that Germany was a world power whose interests must not be neglected by its rivals in 1911 are only one example in this respect. Whatever aims the Chancellor may have hoped to achieve, they had proved castles in the air indeed. Moreover, the whole Morocco affair had backfired in poor upon the imperial government, for Britain's reaction and the lack of visible gains had unleashed a wave of nationalism so far unknown. This in turn had finally not only proved an almost golden opportunity for Turpitz to introduce another novella, in order to thwart Turpitz's plan, the Chancellor had convinced the army's leadership to ask for a strengthening of its units. First, neglected for many years, an army bill would, would help push back the Navy in fierce intergovernmental negotiations about the distribution of the rice financial resources. Second, an increase of the army would be a clear signal to Germany's neighbors that the government was willing to defend its interests on the continent with military means if necessary. Third, and perhaps most importantly, an increase of the army would help assuage the wave of nationalism which had threatened to sweep away the government in the month following the Agadir disaster. At first sight, these calculations seemed convincing. Unfortunately, the Chancellor did not fully realize that this decision could unleash an arms race on land, which in turn could also have disastrous results. Moreover, the fiercer the arms race, the more difficult it would be to contain the hordes within the army and the public, who were openly demanding a war, the sooner the better. The chief of the general staff and influential publicists openly dealt with this problem. By invoking the example of the Seven Years' War, they suggested to imitate the policy of Frederick the Great. Despite great losses, the famous pre predecessor of the Emperor had thus defended Prussia's position on the continent. In a secret speech before his generals and admirals, commemorating the 200th anniversary of Frederick the Great in January 1912, Willem II had referred to the latter's policy. Even Turpitz was afraid of a war before the Navy was ready and had begun to change his mind. In October 1913, he criticized the policy of the Chancellor, which, in his eyes, would eventually reduce Germany to a second-rate power depending <coughs> upon Britain's goodwill. Instead, he preferred to fight for, I quote, the supreme aim and perish honorably instead of renouncing the future ingloriously. Unquote. Last but not least, developments in other areas could severely diminish his options in case of a serious conflict, as events in the Balkans soon proved. With political support from Russia, the <coughs> Balkan states had driven out the Ottoman Empire out of its last European outposts. The result of this victory, however, was that the position of Austria-Hungary in the Balkans, as well as on a European scale became increasingly, increasingly weaker, for Serbian nationalists openly declared that they would not turn their attention to the dual monarchy in order to free their countrymen then under Austrian rule and unite them in one state dominated by Serbia. In 1912, as well as in 1913, Britain and Germany, however, succeeded in restraining their respective allies from escalating the Balkan crisis into a great European war. Working together at the ambassadorial conference in London and even forming an international naval force 
to impl implement its decision against Montenegro in 1913, they had given an important example of how serious conflicts could be solved. Why did this model not work a year later? In spring 1914, Germany's decision makers faced a difficult international situation. On the one hand, relations with Great Britain seemed to improve. After many years of increasing tensions, the naval question almost played no role. Instead, the Secretary of the Imperial Navy Office had again confirmed in Parliament that Germany accepted the existing ratio between the High Seas Fleet and the Royal Navy. As a sign of goodwill, a British squadron, squadron for the first time in 10 years came to Germany to take part in Kiel Week. Moreover, two agreements about minor colonial questions were ready for signature. Astonishingly enough, even one of the hawks in the British Foreign Office, Arthur Nicholson, shared this opinion. Quote, Since I have been at the Foreign Office, I have not seen such calm waters. Unquote. On the other hand, Several events and developments seemed to indicate that Germany's security dilemma was increasing. France and Russia were obviously intensifying their efforts to strengthen their military position towards Germany. The new three-year law in France and Russian plans to improve its railway system in the western provinces in order to accelerate the mobilization of its army should be mentioned here. Moreover, reports from a German spy in the Russian embassy in London nourished the feeling that the tribal Entente was on the verge of becoming a real alliance aiming at containing Germany. Most importantly, the naval talks between Russia and Britain dealt with the question of a Russian landing in Pomerania, supported by the Royal Navy, thus offering the prospect of a quick Russian march onto Berlin, which was only 50 miles away from the coast. On the other hand, Germany's position in Europe seemed to get weaker every year. Austria-Hungary was almost helplessly entangled in, do in its domestic troubles, and Italy, despite the renewal of the tribal alliance in 1912, was still regarded as unreliable as always before. Fully in line with his recommendations in the year before, the chief of the general staff therefore urged the German foreign secretary in early June to wage a preventive war as soon as possible. In his eyes, postponing a war would mean risking Germany's existence. Against this background, even Chancellor Bethmann Hollweg looked more gloomily into the future than ever before, asking his son, for example, whether it was really worth while planting new trees on his estate near Berlin. The Russian steamroller, he argued, would soon destroy them anyway. Whereas Bethmann Hollweg had told his critics who had urged for a war in April to be more patient, for Germany would soon be able to buy the world instead of conquering it militarily at a much higher cost and with uncertain results, he now also seemed willing to take war into account when he received the news of the assassination of the Austrian-Hungarian heir to the throne. For Austria-Hungary, the murder of Francis Ferdinand once again confirmed the assumption that Serbia, which without any proof was at once blamed as the real culprit behind the assassination, was a serious danger to its, its existence, and accordingly this problem had to be solved at once and forever. Unlike in former years, the political and military leaders of the dual monarchy were unwilling to give in once again. For the survival of the dual monarchy, as well as its prestige among the great powers, it seemed inevitable to teach Serbia a lesson. This meant nothing else but war. All decision makers were also willing to take the risk that this war might entail a great European conflagration. In order to be successful, they seek the support of the German government. Subsequently, in early July, a special Austrian envoy, Count Hoyos, traveled to Berlin, where he was given the so-called blank check by both the Emperor and the Chancellor. Why did the German government issue this blank check? First, against the background of Germany's deteriorating position in Europe, this seemed to offer an almost golden opportunity to turn the tide. In contrast to former crises, Germany was not involved directly. Instead, 
It only wanted to support an ally who rightly wanted to take revenge for the murder of its heir to the throne and once and for all give a response which was supposed to have a lasting effect. Second, a local war in the Balkans would not only help Austria to paint Serb irredentism, but also stop the latter's steady decline as a great power. This in return would have strengthened Germany's position as, as well uh, towards the Entente. Third, a victorious local war also, would also help to reduce the influence of Russia as well as of France on Austria's doorstep. Fourth, moreover, if Austria beat Serbia without the Russians coming to their support, Panslavism would also suffer a severe blow. Fifth, if Russia shied at intervening on Serbia's behalf for fear of fighting alone, this would be a diplomatic setback, which in turn, which in return might lead to a crisis of the Entente and thus help enlarge Germany's political freedom of movement. And sixth, if Russia, however, opted for war in order to support the regicides in Belgrade, the German government was confident to win the Great War, which this decision would entail, even if Great Britain, whose position seemed unclear, would eventually enter this war on the side of its own partners. The last option was indeed a worst-case scenario. However, the German government was confident, or at least clung to the idea, that the Russian Tsar, due to the latter's deep-rooted fear of a revolution, would not support the assassins of a fellow monarch and thus allow Austria to take revenge. However, events soon proved that this notion was nothing but wishful thinking. First, if at all, this strategy was only feasible if Austria acted at once and declared war upon Serbia before the shock about the assassination had faded away and been replaced by sober political, power political considerations. Second, more importantly, why should the Entente powers, whose position in Europe towards the dual alliance in, in general as well as in, in the Balkans in particular, had very much improved in the years before, allow Germany and Austria to exploit a local conflict to their advantage? Unfortunately, Germany's decision makers never really calculated these risks. Instead, they tried to push the Austrians to confront Belgrade with an ultimatum which the Serbian government could not accept. At the same time, the German government tried to appease the other great powers, hoping to convince them that Austria was fighting a just cause. In the end, this did not work, for the members of the Entente were not willing to allow Austria to crush Serbia with German backing and thus perhaps drive a wedge between the Entente powers. The fundamental dilemma of these developments was the fact that all decision makers at some point had to decide whether and when they would order mobilization in order to back their political strategies, strategies with military force. Austria's decision to reject Serbia's answer to the ultimatum and to attack Serbia caused Russia to order partial, soon general mobilization. This in turn prompted the German government to mobilize its army and its navy as well. More importantly, in order to fully exploit the advantages of its military strength, the German government declared war upon Russia and France. At the same time, it sent an ultimatum to the Belgian government demanding free passage through its territory. The infamous Schlieffen plan, carefully developed in the decade before, left no option. Only a quick victory against France before the Russian steamroller had begun its move against Germany's eastern provinces seemed to promise success. The fact that the violation of Belgian neutrality would inevitably be draw Britain into the war was one of the as one of the guarantors of Belgian neutrality was never really thoroughly calculated. Wolke used to argue that the Prussian police would be sufficient to arrest Britain's 100,000 men army. The Chancellor hoped that Britain would stay out of the war at least long enough until important decisions on the battlefield had fallen. Sooner than expected, all hopes connected with the decision to unleash a European war proved wrong. This narrative has been challenged by some historians in the past. They argue that the outbreak of war in 1914 is not an Agatha Christie drama at the end of which we will discover the culprit standing over a corpse 
in the conservatory with a smoking gun. There is no smoking gun in this story, or rather, there is one in the hands of every major character. Viewed in this light, the British historian Christopher Clarke has recently argued the outbreak of war was a tragedy, not a crime. This argument is fully in line with the tendency to, do, to review the parts each of the governments played in July 1914 by taking, in account, into account, by taking into the shorter as well as the longer uh, developments which eventually caused this tragedy. It is indeed striking to see how openly Russian and French politicians and generals discussed the question of war against Germany, how confident they seemed to be that a war whose origins lay in the Balkans would help push back Germany and its most reliable ally, Austria. It is also striking to see how openly those responsible in Vienna planned a war against Austria's neighbor and that they might have gone to war without German support. Similarly striking are the roles of the military in each country as well as of those openly demanding war regarded as a justified means in politics in the public. In this respect, Moltke hardly differed from his fellow chiefs of staff in Paris, St. Petersburg, or even London. Last but not least, all great powers, <coughs> the imperialist powers, which as unscrupulously as Germany pursued their aims. To put it more simply, there was no good and there was no bad imperialism at that time. Looking at these new interpretations, many historians think that it is indeed justified to argue that all decision makers opted for war because they were convinced that they only defended legitimate interests of their respective country. However, such an interpretation should not forget that it was, in my opinion, the German government which first decided to use this conflict to solve a problem for which it itself was responsible its isolation in Europe as a result of a policy which it had deliberately embarked upon at the turn of the century. This does, however, not mean that all the others were innocent victims, for when the ball had begun rolling, they refrained from stopping it for fear of also losing either a political or a military advantage in the great game. Thank you very much.